Okay, we are moving um, on in forces to talk about drag, but before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about integrating, I guess. Um, we're all pretty familiar, at least we should be by now, of the derivative. Even if we're not quite sure how to spell the derivative. And, and, and the simple case of things that we've been doing, you should have been doing in calculus, d over dx of x to the n, or, you know, the derivative of that function is nx to the n minus 1. So if we have x cubed, the derivative of that, okay, so f is equal to x cubed, f prime is equal to 3x squared. Well, the antiderivative is the integral. Basically, we're going to do the opposite of this. It is the opposite function. So, uh, the way we do integrals, integral sign, and we're just going to do, in this case, x to the n dx. This would be doing the opposite uh, of that. <clears throat> so, um, technically what this means, you're all very familiar with the derivative being uh, a way to find the slope of a curved function. But if this is my function, the integral is a way to find the area of that function. Those of you in BC should be doing this by now. Those of you in AB are going to see this for a while. Now, one way that we could do this is, is make these little squares where that would give me f at x times a little bitty delta x. That's sort of that big. But that's not very accurate, especially if this thing changes. What I want to do is make this delta x get very, very, very tiny. <clears throat> so one little sliver of that would be f at x times the teeniest, tiniest pit bit of this x. We call that dx. That would give me that one area. If I, if I want the, the total area, I'd have to sum all of those little bitty dx slices that are f of x tall. Um, and so I'd have to be taking an infinite sum of all these tiny little slices. Well, that's the same thing as the integral. My pen is not working with me today. Of That's the same thing as taking the integral of f of x times dx. That's all it is. It's finding the area of that function. So as far as being the opposite function goes, um, the integral of x to the n dx is going to be <clears throat> x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Let me explain. When we took the derivative, we brought down the exponent and made it smaller. Here we're going to have to make it bigger, and instead of multiplying by the exponent, we're going to have to divide by it. So to show an example, um, the integral of 3x squared dx should give me x cubed. So we're going to do these rules. Um, we're going to take that 3x and we're going to raise it to the power one more. So 3x cubed and we're going to divide by that new power. It gets me right back where I started. It's an opposite function. That's all it is. It's undoing what the integral did. And that works just fine until um, we talk about the integral of x to the negative 1 dx. In that case, if we follow our rule, we're going to have x to the negative 1 plus 1 is 0 divided by 0. This is a problem, and it's a bad one. 
for that we have to do an exception. Before we move on to that exception, one of the things that students always ask is, what happens to the dx? The dx is the product of these two things together. That's one of the things that goes into finding that area. So 3x squared times dx. Well, that has a unit of x. That's how we get to x to the third. It's in there. It's part of the multiplication that happens. But when we do our integral, that thing goes away. So let's talk about our exception. The integral of x to the negative 1 dx. Uh, another way that's written is the integral of dx over x. Now, we cannot use our power rule. This is bad because we cannot have x to the 0 over 0. That's no good. So, instead of thinking of it as uh, in terms of an integral, f prime of what function is equal to 1 over x? If, if f prime of x is 1 over x, uh, we should know that f of x is equal to the natural log of x. Or, or if we were to get more complicated, um, let, well, we'll get more complicated later. So f of x is equal to the natural log of x. So what we do is say that the integral of x to the negative 1 dx is equal to the natural log of x. Now, let's say we have f of x, and that whole thing is to the negative 1 dx. Well, it works the same way. We have the natural log of f of x, and what we're going to do is divide by whatever f prime of x is. Just like, well, just like if you had f of x is equal to the natural log of x squared, you would say that it's the wrong one. f prime of x is equal to 1 over x squared times 2x. We will work this out. Here's the reason we're talking about it. Falling through a resistive medium. So, let's say I have a ball that falls, but there is a drag force of negative BV on it. I got mg down, negative BV up. That is drag or air resistance, the thing that we've been ignoring up until now. now I know that the object's going to accelerate this way, but I want to know what that looks like. So, Newton's law, sum of my forces equals that mass times its acceleration, going to be mg minus that drag force. Now, what this means is, as I speed up, my drag force gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. At some point, I'm going to get 0 equals mg minus bv. This point is our terminal velocity. It's where we stop accelerating. It's the point where our drag force is equal to our weight. And, and this is a really easy thing to find. It's just mg over b. <clears throat> That's not the tough thing to do. The tough thing is, well, ma is equal to mg minus bv. What's going to happen to this velocity? What is the velocity as a function of time before we get to the terminal velocity. Terminal velocity happens when acceleration is equal to zero. I want to know what the velocity looks like
from the beginning up until that point. And I notice that I have an acceleration and a velocity. My acceleration is going to increase until the velocity gets to the right size. What I have are two things that depend on each other in a weird way. Um, so instead of looking at it like this, I want to look at acceleration as the derivative of velocity with respect to time. What I have now then is m times dv over dt equals mg minus dv. This is our first differential equation. It's differential because I have a derivative and the thing that I'm taking the derivative of together in my equation. So we're going to bring this over to the next page and talk about how to solve that differential equation for velocity. All right, so mass times the derivative of velocity over time is equal to um, mg minus dv. What I want to do is put everything that has V on one side and everything that's not V onto the other side. So I've got this dV over mg minus dV. This whole thing is velocity, is a function of velocity. And that leaves me with dt over m. Well, I don't want my equation to stay that way. I want to get rid of all these little differential pieces. The way that we get rid of all these differential pieces is to add them all together, which is taking the integral. So I need to take the integral of both sides. Now, we're going from time equals 0 to time equals t. At the same time, we're going to go from velocity equals 0 to some later velocity. Not the terminal velocity, just some later velocity. So. By taking this integral, we're adding up all of the little pieces of just dt. So I have uh, t times m. That's it. Adding up all dt's gives me t. If, if we're to do the power rule, it's um, t to the 0 d dt. So I add 1, divide by 1. That leaves me with t. We go back over here and we have something that's a little bit more complicated. dv is m. This is my function, mg minus bv. So what I get is, we'll talk about limits too, the natural log of this function, mg minus bv, over the derivative of that function, negative b from 0 to v. If you look back at what we did with natural logs, with taking this integral, it's the natural log of the whole function divided by the derivative of the function. That's going to be how we evaluate this thing. Now what this means is I'm going to take all of that, I'm going to plug in v, so natural log of mg minus bv over negative b minus that whole value evaluated at zero. And that's equal to t times n. We didn't change that side of the equation. So all that happens when I plug zero in is that goes away. So I've got, let's get rid of the negative b. Oh, I did that wrong. Sorry. It's not t times n. I apologize. It's t over n. So, <clears throat> let's get rid of that negative b. So I have the natural log of mg minus bv minus the natural log of mg. And that's equal to negative b times t over n. What we have to do here is remember some rules about natural logs because I need to simplify this side. So what I get is the natural log of mg minus bv over mg is equal to negative bt 
over m. And if I want to get rid of that natural log, I have to make that the exponent of each side. So e to the natural log of mg minus bv over mg is equal to that. What happens is that e and the natural log sort of cancel out. They negate each other, and I get mg minus bv over mg is equal to e of the minus bt over m. I'm not done yet. Now I have to do algebra to solve for v. So multiply both sides by mg. mg minus bv equals mg times e to the negative bt over m. Negative bv equals mg e to the negative bt over m minus mg. Swap around that negative sign. bv equals I'm going to pull an mg out. mg times 1 minus e to the bt over m. So complicated. The velocity comes out to mg over b times 1 minus e to the negative bt over m. That's how this function is going to change. If you haven't seen an integral yet, all of this is going to be terribly confusing. It will get clearer as we go on. But just to talk about it, this is velocity as a function of time. When time is equal to zero, I have one minus e to the zero. e to the zero is one. One minus one is zero. When time is zero, the velocity is equal to zero. As time goes on, if we put infinity in, I get one minus e to the negative infinity. It's one minus zero. After a very long time, that's going to be my constant velocity, which, if you look back, is the same as the terminal velocity. We're going to spend, again, a lot of time talking through this. This is the last new bit of information we have to cover before our test, and our test is next Thursday. That's a ton of time. It's a weird way to say it. We have a lot of time to process this information. If it's a little unclear, that's okay. It won't be by the time we finish.